Welcome everyone to Spirit of Truth Church for this sermon on Matthew 9, 32-34. And now let's open with a word of prayer. Thank you, Lord. We praise your name for all that you are. We praise you for your sovereignty. We praise you for your omnipotence and your omniscience. We praise you for your holiness and your mercy and your justice. Thank you, Lord, that you are exactly who you are, nothing less. Thank you, Lord, that you are perfection. And thank you, Lord, that you have called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. We praise your name. Amen. And now for the reading of the scripture. Matthew 9, 32-34 Just as they were going out, a demon-possessed man, who was unable to speak, was brought to him. When the demon had been driven out, the man spoke, and the crowds were amazed, saying, Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. But the Pharisees said, He drives out demons by the ruler of demons. Now I'd like to argue that the main idea of these verses is as follows. These verses present Jesus as the prophet like Moses, who was different than all other prophets who came before. This prophet would speak to God face to face, be the mediator of a new covenant. He would be the servant of Isaiah, the Messiah. And now let's move to the exegetical portion of the text. So verse 32, this incident is occurring on their travels. So again, if, if we, they were coming from Capernaum, uh, they were getting out of their travels here. And a demon-possessed man is brought to Jesus. And I want to be very clear on this. The demon-possessed man didn't come to him for healing. He was brought by others. He did not come purely of his own volition or of his own choosing. And it's also possible that not only could he not speak, he might also not be able to hear. A kophos uh, is blunt or dull and could be used of speech or hearing. We don't know. I mean, it definitely speak, but it could also be of hearing as well. And again, the secular usage at that time, uh, it could mean both simultaneously. But either way, this illness was being directly caused by demonic forces in this instance, by demon possession. Now in verse 33, we see that Jesus is going to cast out the demon and the mute is able to speak. And there are two responses. The first response is this, it's from the people. Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. This was assumed to be a completely hopeless case. This was assumed to be, he's demon-possessed, he can't speak, he can't, possibly can't hear. Nothing can help him. No one can save him. He, he is simply lost. But Deuteronomy 18, 15 through 19 says this, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own brothers. You must listen to him. This is what you requested from the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let us not continue to hear the voice of the Lord our God or see this great fire any longer so that we will not die. Then the Lord said to me, they have spoken well. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. I will put my words in his mouth and he will tell them everything I command him. I will hold him accountable Whoever does not listen to my words, that he speaks in my name. In Deuteronomy 34.10, no prophet has arisen again in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And so we're seeing something here. And this might give you chills because this is a prophecy right here. This is the prophet like Moses. God said, I'm going to raise someone up from among your own brothers and put his words in his mouth. And that everyone who does not listen will be held accountable. And we're seeing that prophet like Moses come. We're seeing him come in these verses. Nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. You speak truly, people who observe. You speak truly, for a prophet like Moses has not come yet. Now the Pharisees respond very differently. They absolutely reject Jesus and they attribute this miracle to demonic power. And I want to mention this because proofs cannot change the wicked heart. I'd like to make this quote. The problem the unregenerate have in not accepting Christ 
is not so much a matter of not having proof of Jesus' authority and truth, but having a darkened heart that is unwilling to believe, end quote. The problem is people aren't born again. You have to be born again in order to accept Christ. You, otherwise, your heart is simply unwilling to believe. And the accusation that it was demons is also interesting because they accepted the reality of the miracle. They accepted that this happened. They accepted the demon was cast out. They accepted that he could speak. They said, we accept the reality of this, but we do not accept the source. You must be demonic. And the word, by the way, the words, to archanti ton daimonion, the ruler of demons. You can get archon, if you ever heard the word archon, that's from the Greek, archon ruler. Is, the, is also in Matthew, denoted as a Beelzebub, in Matthew 12, 24. And that's going to be, by the way, one of the most important verses we're going to read in the entire section of Matthew. It's the turning point of Jesus' ministry. We'll get there. And it's most likely from the words Baal Zebul, or God of dung, or God of idolatrous sacrifice. And so, essentially, they're, they're really trying to throw shade at Jesus here very heavily. And what's going to happen is later on, Jesus is going to link these all together and stand in opposition to them. Now, this is also a preview. The Pharisees' response here is a preview. Uh, and it's a very important preview. Because it is a preview of what is the unforgivable sin and what causes Jesus' ministry to go from the general people to a more internal thing. Once you have the words of Christ and the deeds of Christ, and you reject both of those, the only thing you have left, and Jesus is going to say this is the resurrection, they're going to reject that too. In other words, there's nothing left. They've now committed the unforgivable sin in that generation, which is they simply reject God in person on all levels. They reject the word of God directly. What, what else is there? There is nothing else. In other words, the hardness of the heart is doing what it does. It stands in unbelief. And as a response, this is going to be taken then to be the position of all Israel uh, in terms of national Israel. And that's when things shift from the kingdom has come, the kingdom is near, it's in your midst, to preparation for the church. So we're going to get into that in chapter 12, but I wanted to show you that this is coming, at least starting here in these verses. So let's move on now to the exposition. We have the acceptance by the people and the rejection by the Pharisees. This is simply faith and unwillingness to believe being contrast here. Because there really are only two responses to Jesus. To accept him, to accept his word. But again, why would you do that? Well, the argument actually is you would do it because your heart is simply willing because it's regenerate. In other words, the appropriate response of the regenerate heart to the word of God is to accept it in full faith and belief. The unregenerate heart simply is incapable of doing so. It is simply incapable of doing so. It cannot accept the truth of God. It will justify it in any other way possible. Jesus did the miracle right there. He did it right in front of them. Oh, give us a sign. Here's a sign. Boom! Miracle in front of you. Will you accept? No. It's not about a miracle. It's not about a sign. It's not about healing ministry and, and having that prove that who Jesus is. No, it's not about any of that. So what is the condition of your heart? What is the condition of your heart? Unregenerate heart? Hardness of heart? They are unwilling to believe. Again, this is linked to Matthew 12. We're going to get there later. The unforgivable sin, the ultimate rejection of Jesus by the Pharisees, leading to a major transition in the gospel narrative. Now, I'd like to move on to the Christocentric setting, and we're going to spend a substantial amount of time here uh, because we're going to now dig into the prophet like Moses, this messianic prophecy. So the context of the verse, by the way, in Deuteronomy 18 that I read earlier, is there's evil and unreliable practices of spiritism and necromancy are present in Canaan, and, and arguably also would be in e Egypt as well. But they're present in Canaan. And Moses is looking to the future and offers a reliable, solid, and firm source of truth. In other words, there's so much lies, so many lies and deceit. And he's saying there is a source of truth. And this is very important because this is we're present to the way we see this today. Look at all the critical race theory, social justice theory, Enneagram, yoga, New Age teachings, prosperity gospel. There's so much divination, 
spiritism, you name it, it's everywhere. Lies of the world, what can we believe? We can believe the prophet like Moses. We can believe the one who offers a reliable and solid, firm source of truth. And so I hold that these verses are direct messianic prophecy. They are talking about the Messiah. They are talking about Jesus. For one, they talk about this prophet who would come in the singular form, not plural, not the line of prophets, not a plural line of prophets, but a singular prophet. There would be one who would be raised up from among the brothers. This one is going to have all the uniqueness and authority of Moses, who among all of God's prophets would dare to be able to speak to God face to face. This new prophet that would come, speak to God face to face. You have an affirmation in Scripture that no prophet has arisen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. And I would argue that there was never, that even though that's found in Deuteronomy, there's no prophet again, that that's going to carry throughout the time all the way up until Jesus. If there was a prophet who had risen, uh, even of those later prophets, they, they would have been stated in Scripture that this is the prophet like Moses. So you don't see that for the rest of Israel's history. You never see that prophet like Moses come out. And it seems to indicate that the prophecy of the prophet like Moses was intended to speak solely and directly of an individual, the coming deliverer, the Messiah, who would inaugurate a new covenant. Because again, what does Moses do? He inaugurates an, not the new covenant, but a new covenant, the Mosaic covenant. Okay, This new prophet's going to institute a new covenant. Again, there's also a link to the servant of Isaiah, who would inaugurate, or sorry, who would approach the ancient of days. And both are like Moses because they see God. And again, this is in context of a second exodus and a deliverer. You had the first exodus in Moses. Now you had the exiles, and they're, they're sort of coming back, but things are still pretty messed up. They're, they're still under Roman rule, and you have a new, a new person, a new Messiah, a new prophet who's going to come and deliver them again. And the interesting thing is, is people often look at Isaiah and they say, oh, that's corporate. That's the corporate servant. Well, the corporate individual tension of the servant's resolved if the servant is the prophet like Moses, because that is absolutely singular. And so what are some of the parallels between the prophet like Moses and Jesus? Well, both are God's servants oh, and, and the servant, uh, the uh, servant of Isaiah. The opposition to both is opposition directly to God himself. In other words, they speak God's literal words. People were close to stoning Moses and would kill the servant, as we see. Their spiritual blindness characterizes the wilderness and the ministry during the time of the servant. Both Moses and the servant intercede for Israel. The servant is like the prophet in his relationship with God. The servant listens to God daily so that he can communicate God's message effectively. Moses and the servant are mediators of a covenant. And as the servant of the Lord, the prophet like Moses would provide final atonement for sin. Moses' aspect of being a mediator is one of the central narrative vehicles for depicting the messianic hope. And so what we see here is this prophet like Moses arising. The one whom God has put his very words in his mouth because he is the word of God. And we're seeing now just what it said. He'd be rejected. They would want to put him to death. And so again, what's the relationship to the text? We're seeing it. We're seeing it as they begin to understand that nothing like this has ever been done in Israel. When you see a state like nothing has ever happened in Israel, well, who's the one who's going to come who's going to do things that no one has ever done in Israel before? The prophet like Moses, the servant of Isaiah. He's come and all the Messianic prophecy is just coalescing in this one spot. Now, in terms of application, again, we see nothing like this has ever been seen in Israel. There's this fixation with attempting to recreate in the modern day what was a unique prophecy about the Messiah. People are trying to do things greater than Jesus ever did. Well, guess what? Nothing like that had ever been seen in Israel. There is no such thing as being greater than the one who sends you. Oh, you do greater things. We could talk about that verse, but... We're tr people are consumed with trying to recreate this messianic ministry outside of the context of biblical prophecy, outside of the context of messianic prophecy. We simply have to let Jesus be who he was he and is. He is the Messiah. He is the prophet like Moses. He is the great servant of Isaiah. He does more miraculous things than people will ever see, will ever understand. Because he's the one that's doing them. They pour forth the word of his mouth. And instead, rather than fixating on those attempts to recreate this in the modern day, we need to be concerned with the right response to Scripture. What was the point of this verse? Do you have a right response to the Word of God? 
It's ultimately what this is. I would argue that most of our problems boil down to, are we having the right response to the word of God or not? When God speaks, do we even know what God is saying? There's, there's an issue. When God speaks, do we obey in faith? Do we even know what he says? This is why reading the scripture, listening to sermons, understanding the Bible is so vitally important. Because how can you have a right response to something you don't know? And so here it stands. We have the prophet like Moses' words right here. We have the deeds written down. We have this direct word, divine word from God right here. How will we now respond? Will we respond in faith or rejection? I believe we will respond in faith, and I pray that we all do. And so with that, I will conclude. These verses invite us to look at the whole of Scripture to understand who Jesus is through Messianic prophecy. As we learn more about the prophetic nature of Jesus' ministry, we should incorporate it into our general discipleship and evangelism of others. And now I'll close the word of prayer. Lord, I thank you for these vivid and colorful depictions of who you are. Statements that just resound with power. This idea that you are the prophet like Moses. The idea that you're the servant of Isaiah. These are, these are grand and lofty titles and prophecies. And then seeing them happen on the page is so amazing. So Lord, I praise you for your scripture. May we respond to it always in faith, truth, and obedience. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us here at Spirit Truth Church, and I hope you have a wonderful day. Thank you.